Good evening, everybody. I'm John Quelch, the Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School. And it's a real pleasure this evening to welcome all of you uh, to the first uh, Southern Glazers Distinguished Leaders uh, fireside chat of the new academic year. And uh, I'm delighted especially that uh, we have with us this evening, uh, Scott Salmiers, who is the CEO of ABM, uh, and ABM, of course, as many of you know, uh, is the principal facilities service provider uh, to the University of Miami. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, ABM vehicles and uh, ABM equipment uh, on our campus. And uh, uh, a lot of what has happened over the last year and a half, and we'll discuss this with Scott, a lot of our success is attributable to uh, the efforts of ABM as one of our key partners. Uh, so welcome, Scott. We're delighted and honored to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to do this. Thank you. Um, you know, a ABM is a 112-year-old company. Uh, it's gone through many uh, iterations, but interestingly enough, over the 112 years, I think, prior to you, there have only been six CEOs of the company. So you're the seventh CEO. So that's, that's quite an interesting uh, track record and an interesting uh, historical trajectory. Uh, can you just explain how the company was founded and talk a little bit about how it's evolved over time? Yeah, no, thanks. And, and you know, it's so interesting because we always we we liken ourselves to the company that no one's ever heard of because we're behind the scenes, right? But once you see our logo and emblem, all of a sudden you say, "Oh, I, I see those folks everywhere." So. So, you know, 112 years old, founded in San Francisco and have this really rich legacy of growing from one person with a, a mop and a squeegee cleaning windows in San Francisco to being the 50th largest employer in the United States now. We're a Fortune 500 company, public company. We just celebrated 50 years on the New York Stock Exchange, which there's only maybe 200 companies that have achieved that, which is which is amazing, uh, $6 billion in revenue, 140,000 people. And our, our core services are janitorial, engineering, parking, grounds and landscaping. And we, we service um, some really key end markets, all education, K through 12 and higher ed, of course, that's why we're talking today, and um, commercial real estate, and distribution and manufacturing facilities, and also the aviation sector. And um, it's, it's, it's amazing to see what's happened with this firm to grow to be a Fortune 500 firm. And you know, as I mentioned to you a little earlier, we just announced a half hour ago that we made a major acquisition. We, um, we uh, spent $830 million to buy a $1.1 billion revenue company that does janitorial and engineering. So now we're gonna be over $7 billion in revenue. So it's just been delightful. And, and, you know, if we look at that acquisition, Scott, just to uh, uh, say a little bit more about that, was that a, a geography play? In other words, this was a regional company that was especially strong in an area where you were weak or uh, was, was it in vertic a vertical uh, delivery sector of your business that you needed to uh, shore up? What, what was the attraction? So the answer is yes, <laughs> it was both. It was both. And what I think what's really exciting about this is that 60% of their revenues is on stationary engineering. So when you look at ABM now, we're shifting our mix of business towards engineering, which is sustainability, climate change, energy efficiency. You know, what, what people don't realize about a company like ABM, we've, we've installed nearly half of the EV charging stations in the US. Is so. Yeah, so it's, it's, this is a pretty strategic acquisition for us because we're pivoting more towards where the, we think the world is heading. So com companies like ChargePoint outsource the installation right. to you, right? That's Got right. It. Um, I, I think it's interesting, you didn't mention this, but ABM stand, stood originally for American Building Maintenance was the original name of the company. That's right. And picking up on what you were just saying, how has building maintenance changed over the last, uh, if you like, 20 years or 50 years? Uh, it means something different today, doesn't it, from what it meant uh, 20 years ago? It, it sure does. I mean, it's, it has become so sophisticated and so 
so many, um, everyone's gravitating toward this business because it's, it's going to health and safety in facilities is so important. And if you think about how we were operating in, in the old days, if you will, versus today with sensor technology and expanding into digital, it's, it's a whole different game right now. And, you know, people want to be in healthy, well-maintained spaces and you just can't keep doing it the old way. So uh, if we think about um, um, your own trajectory, I mean, you, you did not start out at ABM. You, you've got a pretty interesting career path. And tell us a little bit about that and how you came to be the CEO of uh, this uh, amazing company. Yeah, I mean, I wish I knew the answer, you know, um, it was, uh, it was, it was a very uh, circuitous path, you know, I graduated with it with an MBA from SUNY Binghamton in New York, and started as a finance person, and, and worked my way into an investment bank, but in a finance role, and it happened to be in a real estate area. So I started learning about real estate and just, you know, just worked my tail off to get to the deal side. And I started really learning about real estate. And next thing you know, I'm working at CBRE and I'm a real estate person. And then I gravitate to Goldman Sachs to run their facilities in North America. And, and then from there, I went to Lehman Brothers where I was head of real estate for North America, dealing with everything from construction to leasing, to space planning, to management. And um, after 9-11, I had an opportunity to go to ABM to, to run a business because heretofore I was always on the support side. And this was a chance to actually run a business. And I always wanted to do that. And I knew it was a risk because being on the support side doesn't necessarily mean you'd be able to be on the business development side and actually run a PL. And I did that. And that was 18 years ago. I joined ABM and I started as a regional director. And just worked my way up. And as they were planning succession, uh, my hat was in the ring for CEO. And seven years ago, I became the CEO. And, you know, with, uh, I know you're a pretty humble guy, but I think I'd like to ask you, what, what do you think the two or three qualities were that you had that led the board to hone in on you as the uh, successor? You know, I, you know, I think about that a lot and, you know, and, and I will say it's so much of this is luck and timing, right. And good fortune. But, you know, from, from when I started my career, I, I always had some basic principles, right. Because you really can't design a career or, or a path uh, prescriptively. Right. So you have to have some foundational principles. And I always said, you know, when I started, uh, I'm just going to outwork everybody. I'm, I'm going to be the first one in the office, the last one to leave. And, you know, it was important to me to always be curious about the work. And I, I said, if I'm going to do this work, I'm going to want to make sure I understand why it hit my desk and where it's going after it hits my desk. And, and the knock-on effect to that was it ends up becoming really enriching in your job because you understand you're, you're a part of the whole. And then, you know what, I have to tell you, John, I've always had a positive attitude. I thought that was always so important and, you know, it's hard and, you know, the best somebody can do is maybe 80% of the time have a positive attitude, right? Because, you know, there's things don't always go your way, but I always try to be positive and, and bring that in and be enthusiastic. And I think um, that that becomes infectious, right? So I, I think it's just a combination of all those things. I know, I know uh, we have the pleasure of uh, having your mom and dad on the call. And, you know, when we, whenever we ask this question about leadership, very few people talk about their parents, but I wonder if you could, especially since they're with us this evening, say a few words about uh, how they contributed to your success. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have done it without their mentorship, right? And, you know, I, I think about my mom and how it was so foundational to her to have relationships and to be that social person and be responsible to people. And then, you know, my dad was, he was always the hardest working person. He was always, you know, on, on Long Island and growing up, many of the people worked for Grumman as engineers, my, my, um, my friend's parents, and my dad worked in the city. So again, he was the first to leave the house and the last one to come back. So he had that work ethic and, and his sense of ethics. I mean, I could tell you stories about him, you know, even a, a, as a young man, like, running back to a tie shop because the sales agent gave him a dollar too much and he was so scared the person was going to get fired and that instilled in me those values that i carried with me through my career 
Um, so let, let's just turn to uh, back to the business for a moment. Um, can you get, get, before getting to the University of Miami, give us a snapshot of uh, the various industries and the, the percentage uh, engagement, uh, percentage of revenues coming from each of those industries in which ABM is involved and uh, various lines of business. How, how do you look at and divvy up your business? Sure. So we, we've made the decision. So when I first joined the firm as CEO, we were organized by service line and we restructured the firm to get organized by end market because we felt like if we could understand our customer better, we could deploy multiple services. So we, we were organized by end market. Our business and industry segment, which is commercial office generally, is about three billion of our six billion prior to the acquisition. And then we have a billion in the aviation sector, a billion in the education sector, which is um, again, split K through 12, right? And then we have a manufacturing and distribution sector, which is a billion as well, which really focuses on the Amazons, the Walmarts, FedEx, you know, we, and we just recently made that change because as we saw how the world was morphing post COVID, that sector has really come into prominence and is going to continue to grow. So we wanted to make sure we were dug in and that's, that's close to a billion dollars in business for us already. Right. And then you use the term service line. What, what do you mean by service line and what are the various service lines that you offer? Yeah, so janitorial is, is and custodial, right, is a very big service line for us, possibly 60% of what we do. And then there's the stationary engineering component of it, which is really the on-site engineers that operate the HVAC, HVAC and mechanical equipment, very big for us. We're, you know, unbeknownst to people, we're the third biggest parking company in the country. Mm -hmm. So depending on certain geographies, you know, you would, you would just think of ABM if you were going to park your car. Right. So that's a big one. And then lastly, and what we're so excited about is we have a technical solutions business, which is energy efficiency projects. So we go into schools as our primary market where we'll look at the mechanical systems and we'll do retrofits for energy efficiency. And um, I, there's untold amounts of educational facilities where we funded school teachers after school programs by going in, changing out the equipment and funding dollars through energy efficiency and saving on utilities. So those are those are our core end markets. And as you can imagine, within each of those, there's all subcategories like exterminating and window washing that we do as part of that. Right. And if you take those various categories, which of those do you do for the University of Miami? So uh, custodial, and we also do landscaping and grounds, which we're so proud of. I mean, it, it, it's truly amazing. We have over 500 staff members between the medical buildings and the campus for you all. Right, fantastic. And, yeah. and uh, uh, do, you, do you do the HVAC as well, or, or is that someone else uh, th these days, the engineering? And... We don't do that yet. All right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, uh, after this call. Yes, okay. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. So, you know, now we've set it up. Uh, so I want you to take your time and just kind of walk, walk us through from your perspective, um, what you had to do and how you worked with the University of Miami starting in March of last year or February of last year when this all came upon us. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you have to dial back to those times, right? We all thought the world was ending, right? It, I mean, it was really unbelievable. So many of us said, oh boy, this is going to be a two or three week thing, right? <laughs> and here we are, right? right? And um, But I, I will tell you, the university was incredible. Uh, first of all, you should know, I'm so proud to be a part of it. My son graduated from the university. I'm a big Keynes fan. Um, our, one of our board members is um, the CEO of FedEx Air and both his daughters went there. So we're, you know, we're, we're all in with the U, right? But um, I think what was so amazing about the administration, they always put the health and safety of the students and the faculty and, and frankly, our team members first. And you, know, you have um, Jess Brumley who runs your facilities and she's um, the finest, just absolute finest. And she was really directing us and you know, and that was her attitude too. We have to keep everyone safe. And we have a, a disinfecting program 
called Enhanced Clean that was developed by an advisory council of epidemiologists and industrial hygienists. And we've been deploying that on campus to keep the kids safe. And as you know, your track record is unbelievable in terms of COVID prevention. So, um, you know, we'd like to think we contribute a lot to, to even to this day, you're still deploying the enhanced clean protocols, which is great. And, you know, for us, culture is so important as a firm. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later, but like the cultural connection between us and, and, and the U and, and Jess and the way she runs the facilities group is just unbelievable because we gravitate towards better run organizations. We just do better that way. And, and you know, there's just no one better than you guys. Um, so can you Id identify, break it down for us, you know, three or four different aspects. You mentioned the enhanced cleaning, but, you know, other, other elements of this um, uh, equation, this partnership equation uh, that you recall as being particularly interesting decisions where, you know, perhaps uh, uh, Jessica Brumley and the U were out ahead of the curve of other institutions? I think, it, you know, I think it gravitates back to what I said. It was starting with the ethos, we have to keep everybody safe. You know, the students are here, or the parents entrust us to take care of them. And um, that, was, that was always it. So every time we went with decisions on what to do, how, how to deploy, it was always this common ground of how do we keep, how do we keep the faculty and the students safe? But there was always concern about our own staff. And, and, then said, and you guys were so generous about anyone who called out sick with COVID about paying them. And because and, they, they, you didn't have to do the things that you did. And I think you guys understood that that just creates stickiness with the staff and dedication. So, you know, we like to think our staff goes the extra mile because of how you all treat us. So I'm, I'm going to try something now with uh, one of my own uh, colleagues who I think has a photograph we'd like to uh, share with you. Um, if uh, Michelle, you could uh, share the screen. Hey. <laughs> so, uh, so this is this is a uh, uh, a lady. She's one of the five hundred folks at uh, the U. Uh, she her name is Julieta. And she's from uh, Nicaragua originally and has two wonderful daughters. And uh, all of the days, the darkest days last year when very few people, if any, were on campus, I, I was uh, habitually uh, trying to keep my routine by coming every day to campus. And uh, this lady was the one person who I saw more often than anyone else on the campus during those dark days. So, uh, I just want to share this with uh, everybody on the call because I think uh, one of the things that most uh, managers really don't do necessarily is, is know who cleans their office. And uh, you ought to know who cleans your office. I think that's so spot on. It's, it, you know, these people are heroes. And, you know, I have to tell you, Dean, if, if you think about what happened, in society during this. Like you think about the hospitals and the healthcare workers. Well, you know, unless there were cleaners that were cleaning the hospital ahead of time, right? It nothing would have went off. And you know, we had we have story upon story of our folks walking through the streets and getting high fives from people, uh, this recognition that they're out there risking their own health and safety. And these people have families, right? And, and they're doing that on behalf of you folks. Right to make sure you're you're safe, and so it's just um, it's it's truly extraordinary. I'm so proud of that, and you know our purpose. We we really believe in our purpose, which is to take care of people, spaces, and places, and and that take care of is, is so special. And we really do believe down to our core that we are a purpose driven company. Mm -hmm. So I want, want to ask you about uh, uh, COVID specifically, and. How has COVID changed your business? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, do you have four more hours? Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's been, it's in, in some ways it's been dramatic. You know, first of all, everything is distributed now and we've had to learn 
how to work in a more distributed fashion with remote work, because not only are some of our staff remote, but our clients are remote. And, and I think for us, when we think about the future, we've always known that we had to move towards a digital future. And I, I feel like not only am I speaking for me, but I'm speaking for all my peer CEOs that I've interacted with over the last six or nine months, and everyone is moving more to a digital world and accelerating it. You know, it, it was always something that we all knew we had to do. And it was always, it was, it was one of the things. Now it's the thing, right? And, you know, for, for ABM, we are investing in all kinds of client-facing technologies. So, so, so people like Jessica, she, if she's not going to see us in face, she's going to get digital dashboards that are going to get tied to sensor technology, and we can communicate data real time. We, we are working feverishly on, on something that every firm has tried and no one's really solved yet, and that's workforce management. How do you enable your, your frontline staff to have a mobile device where when they get on campus, they're punched in. When they leave, they punch out, right? You know, all through their phone where they get a moment of safety. A ABM is like, our, our ethos is safety, safety, safety. So, you know, how do they start their day with a moment of safety and a safety talk, right? And then getting task orders sent to their phone and, and gamification where you can get a high five from a fellow worker or from a student on campus or from someone from facilities and, and so to make it fun. And, and, and this is a way that you can communicate with your frontline. And, and I think a lot of people in my position never realized how challenging it was to, to communicate with frontline workers when you're in a pandemic. So we are putting tens and tens of millions of dollars towards our IT infrastructure over the next five years. Okay. Um, and what, what, what about the, uh, the culture at ABM? I, I've heard some CEOs saying that uh, COVID actually has helped reinforce and solidify the yeah. culture uh, as opposed to draw it apart yeah uh, so uh, let me let me tell you the three attributes that we have as our culture and i'll tell you how it works so well for covid so and, and when when i say these are the three attributes it's not scott salmier's three attributes this is we've talked to people all throughout the firm and we coalesced on three things collaboration accountability to each other and customer focus. And if those three things are your core culture attributes, think about how that works in COVID, right? Where, where you're scrambling to find solutions for clients, scrambling to keep people safe, right? All the things that happened during the pandemic, but if you feel accountable to each other, accountable to your clients, if you have a customer focus, where that's so important to you and, and you, you, you collaborate as a core value, that was the keys to the kingdom to us. That's what made us so successful through COVID is our culture. And I think it's resonated throughout our company. And, you know, I mean, maybe we'll kind of delve into this topic, but when you think about remote work, and again, this is what all companies are challenged with. We, we all know that remote work is here to stay, right? The, the whole concept of five days a week in the office, nine to five, I mean, that, you know, I, I think you'd agree that is out the window now, right? It's, it's all about hybrid work. And, and th then the question becomes, if what defines your organization is your culture, how do you keep that culture front and center in a more remote world where people aren't right and it, it's not so much even your existing people that are legacy people what about when you hire new people we're hiring new people all the time and if the only thing they experience is remote access to us i don't know that's that if you were to ask me what's most concerning to me on its most strategic level not and markets and acquisitions and strategy for margin to me it's about culture and in a hybrid world, how do we keep people sticky and passionate? So when the next COVID happens, people work day and night, seven days a week and are passionate because of their culture. And because uh, if not, Dean, I think every company is gonna be facing hiring a bunch of free agents. 
that the next time 10% salary comes somewhere else, they'll feel no passion at all towards the company they're at. So, you know, it, 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 I don't lay awake much, but if I am laying awake at night, it's how do I preserve and inculcate the culture with new folks? Mm -hmm. If we uh, if we were to ask uh, a group, a random group of ABM folks uh, on our campus to, uh, you know, evaluate how how we are as a client um, and, and how we treat them as uh, uh, respected uh, helpers of our to, to, to our mission. Uh, how do you think they would respond? Oh, I, I, first thing that comes to my mind is like, what do you mean? This is my family. Okay. I mean, it's just, it, it's, oh my gosh. Like I've toured the campus so many times and, you know, with my team and it's like the pride they take in what they do. And, you know, I will tell you probably more than anywhere else I toured, when you walk through with them, what they do is they point out personal stories. They don't just say, this is this building or this, that. They're like, this is this building. And, you know, last week this happened and this is what we did. There's, there is this, and, and again, when you, when you talk about a staff of such scale to think that they have that personal bond, I mean, it speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to encourage uh, our uh, attendees to uh, please send in some questions uh, via the uh, Q and A function will be will be going to your questions uh, shortly. Um, what what do you think about um, this? Is a slightly controversial one, Scott. So excuse me, but what do you think about unions? So you you may be surprised about my answer. We actually, on the whole, we like working in a union environment. And you know, listen, it's always challenging, right? You know, so because I, I will be candid, but I'll I'll tell you what unions do for us in our particular business. Mm -hmm. It affords us the ability to pay higher wages to our workers, right? It's not a you know in a non-union market, it's the lowest wage wins in a bid a lot of times, and that's not ABM's forte, right? So um, it makes it more challenging. So we like the fact that it's higher wages, it's benefits, and um, and for us, that, that it, it helps organize the market in a sensible way. And, you know, again, what we also like is they generally have a firm handle on the number of staff. So if, if it is a situation like University of Miami and we're tendering a bid for, for the work, you know, we, so let's make believe we really did have 500 people on campus, right? What's to present, prevent a competitor from coming in if it was non-union saying, we could do this with 450 people and our price is $2 million lower than ABM. Hey, that may be appealing to the university and they'll ultimately fail, but you know, people like Jessica can come back now and say, well, wait a second, 450, you, even if you wanted 450, there's 500 people on this campus, right? So it creates a sense of order, right? Um, you know, there, there are other things about the union we don't love. That it's less flexible. If you can be productive, sometimes say, no, there's 500 people, even if you could do it with 480, right? So um, there's challenges as well. But on the whole, I think it if you have a reasonable relationship with them and there's a healthy tension, it can be productive. But, you know, there are challenges. When you're, uh, when you're recruiting for either the, um, if I can use the term white collar, as well as the blue collar roles, where do you find your talent? Where do you find those people? So it's probably different today than it's been. So well, let's talk about the white collar, right? And so much of it is LinkedIn. So it depends if it's kind of C-suite and executive levels, we're dealing with recruiting firms like Corn Ferry and Spencer Stewart, all the, all the ones that you know, right? Um, and then if it's more mid-level, you're talking about LinkedIn and, and outreach and referrals. And, and that's just the way we do it. We probably don't do enough on-campus recruiting, which is what we should talk to you all about, you know, going forward, right? Um, so that's the way we do it. And then for blue collar, you know, I have to tell you, it's still a ground game. It's, you know, to find these folks, it, it is referrals. It's, it's, it's doing town halls 
It's, go, it's sitting outside of churches, sitting outside of uh, it, it, anywhere where you're on the ground and you can tell the story. Um, and we've tried to do it in more of a techie fashion and it just doesn't work for, for frontline workers. It's, it's part of the solution, but if you're not in the community and talking about your values and pointing to examples of success, I mean, you know, Dean, I, I have to tell you, I could tell you two people in the tri-state area of New York, one that started as a night supervisor that is running $1.4 billion in business for us. And another gentleman who started as a doorman who couldn't speak English 25 years ago, and he's running $400 million of business for us. And, and these guys are outstanding at their job. So we talk about a path and, you know, ABM, I, I, I'm not trying to be teary eyed here, but in a lot of ways, ABM is part of the American dream. You come in, a lot of our workers are immigrants that come in and it's a start and they live together in a household, multi-generational, send their first kid off to college. And there's untold stories about people that work at ABM that have just made a better life for themselves. And it's just, we, we just, there's a lot of pride in that for us. Yeah. Uh, and with, with respect to the um, so-called labor shortage that we hear about in Florida all the time, in terms of the hospitality industry, um, yeah. have you have you experienced that yourself? Oh boy, yep, yeah. It's um, this is it is you know we hear the term labor crisis that it, you know that's not an exaggeration, and there are all these statistics out there about how many jobs there are and how many employees to fill those jobs, and the gap is really scary. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're also waiting for the stimulus to wear off the extra unemployment stimulus that's going to wear off at the beginning of September, hopefully more people will enter the workforce, but there is a real crisis and the concept of a war on talent is real. I mean, if I, if I'm a student listening to this now, hopefully you all have really big smiles on your face because, um, there there's, and then, you know, and then you graduate from a place like the U, you definitely have a leg up. Right. But um, boy, it is really tough. And we we we've brought some of the learnings from COVID towards this crisis, because when we went into COVID, we created task forces for all the important things. When we thought the world was ending, we said, how are we going to collect our money now, at any given time? ABM is owed six or seven hundred million dollars from our clients. Right. So we thought are our clients collapsing? Is the world collapsing? What's going to happen? We have to pay our employees. We have to keep our people safe. So all these work streams, we created task forces that were multidisciplinary. So not just operational folks, but HR, finance, legal. And we put that together. And that's why we had such success through COVID. I mean, we've had six record quarters in a row since it started. So you go from thinking the world's ending to where we are now. And, and that was so successful that we've created a task force just on retaining and attracting talent. And I won't claim to have all the answers now because it's so complicated, but there's probably nothing more important to any firm. And, and that's another thing. When I talk to peer CEOs, the very first thing everyone talks about is talent and, and the labor shortage. Okay. Um, you know, just... Without, without pinning you down, but uh, for our audience, just roughly speaking, what is the turnover rate in the industry? What's the range of annual turnover? Yeah, this? so yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. It's over 50%, okay. yeah, right? So you're, you're recruiting nonstop, obviously. Well, well, think about it this way. We have 140,000 people. We have to hire 70,000 people a year. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing because if you do the math, it feels like probably one in five Americans have worked for ABM at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here, here are a few, uh, you know, pretty interesting questions from our uh, uh, webinar audience. So, um, you know, what, one I hadn't thought of before, but um, it relates to the, the stock being thinly traded uh, and the... Uh, the company's stock is largely held by institutions, but isn't covered by Morningstar. And can you can you explain what uh, what's going on here? Yeah. So, um, well, so 
it's this is super super complicated so the first thing you look at from from an investor relations standpoint is you want certain analysts to cover you want analyst coverage right so we have six analysts that cover cover us so we have the right amount of coverage but as a three billion mid-market company you're not going to have like a morning star or what have you but we certainly do get plenty of notoriety and you know we'll trade about four hundred thousand shares a day which is um probably double from when I started. So we're doing a good job in terms of attracting investment and, and analyst attention. I think this new acquisition that we're announcing is going to raise it that much more. Um, and then the other challenge will be interesting for some of your students um, to get coverage. It has to be, this is going to say, hopefully no analysts are listening now. It has to be easy for analysts. And, and when I say easy, there has to be four or five minimum peer companies in the sector so that when they when they level set you when they build their complicated models they can plug in five companies there's really nobody like abm as a public company so it's a high bar to commit to cover and put in the rigor around it and you know sometimes we talk about this and we talk about hey do we want to get broader coverage do we want you know goldman sachs to cover us and the counsel we've got is be careful what you ask for because if it's not interesting enough for them and they cover you, they're not going to do the right job and you're not going to get the right traction. So we, we feel pretty good about where we are right now, but it, it's something that we've been working on for the last five years. Okay. Here's a, a strategy question. Um, which, which is more effective um, in, this, in this market space uh, to um, basically be selling individual service lines or to attempt to be a one-stop shop for the client, uh, where, you're, where you're basically, I guess, giving them a deal for pooling all of their service needs across multiple lines with you. So that, first of all, I just want to compliment because that's a really insightful question, whoever sent that in. That was really, you know, someone out there has really switched on to ask that question, and it's a good one. So here's the way I'd answer it. We would love to start out relationships multi-service. We think we could offer a lot of value and it makes sense, right? Because you get economies of scale, but we don't control that because many times, if not most times, we're responding to RFPs where right. it'll be issued by the client. So they dictate. So, so what we've done creatively over the last few years is we've responded and then we said, oh, here's the B proposal. The B, the B proposal is what you've asked for, plus some ideas about how we could provide more capabilities. And there's been a few instances where we've won the assignment by them saying, we don't necessarily need that other thing now, but the fact that you guys are so well-rounded and have that made us vote for you. Is this, a, is this still, Scott, a very fragmented industry uh, where there's a lot of chance and opportunity for uh, roll-ups to occur? You know, people think that on its face, and it is a very fragmented business. But for a lot of our com smaller competitors, it's a lifestyle company, and it affords them a really nice living. And when you go and offer them a seven or eight times multiple of EBITDA, which is kind of where these things trade, they kind of do the after-tax math on that. And they'd say, you know what, I'd rather keep operating our company. So um, no one's really been successful doing roll-ups in our industry. Um, and, and for us, it, it wouldn't, it would, you would think it'd be a, a valid strategy, but we like went after this big company, this billion dollar company. And what many CEOs will tell you, it takes as much energy and effort to integrate a $50 million company as a $500 million company. So to, to spend the resources of the firm on an integration that's not a scale, um, unless you're private equity, and you know, not to get too complicated, but the, the play with private equity is to buy a platform company of some scale and then roll up smaller companies, they'll have the energy for that. But if you're, if you're a strategic like, like ABM, uh, it's just, it's not a good use of your resources. Okay. Um you had uh, been, I think, the architect of something called the 2020 vision at uh, ABM. Uh, did that survive COVID or did it have to be uh, reworked? 
it actually, it did survive COVID. And I think a lot of the elements of what we did during 2020 vision made us successful. And we just, it's not for public consumption, but internally we just announced our next five-year journey that's going to take the platform we developed at 2020 Vision and elevate that, which is the name of our program, over the next five years. And uh, it's just it's just quite exciting. You know, um, you know, prior, we never really had a, a solidified strategy. And I, I will tell you, there is something super powerful about organizing a firm around a strategy that's tangible and a stretch, but achievable. And it was the first time probably in many, many years that ABM had that very thing with 2020 vision. And it was just, it was so palpable, which is why we said we're gonna brand and name our next five-year journey, which we just kicked off internally. And we'll be sharing with our investor group in the next three or four months. Okay, so here's a slightly different question. Can you please invent a noiseless leaf blower? Yeah, exactly. I'll take one of those two for my house. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. It's quite a noisy landscaping it is quite noisy. Right. And, you know, they, they are coming out with more electric ones, but um, in an institutional setting, uh, there's just not a lot of appetite for something that after 45 minutes is going to lose its power. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, but just kind of an interesting follow up to that. Do you do you get involved with uh, as as a major user of that equipment? Are you involved in uh, manu with the manufacturers in uh, um, perhaps shaping the design of the next generation of product? Yeah, we do. We're, we're fortunate because again, the scale and the buying power of ABM. There's there's no one like them. So like a company like Tenant, which is one of the biggest manufacturers of whether it's vacuums, all the ride-on equipment, they'll bring us into their innovation labs. And, and the, they, they want to iterate with us because we have the voice of the customer, right? So they don't want to do it independently. So we do get the good fortune of being part of that. Mm -hmm. how, how, how centralized is ABM and versus decentralized in terms of the way in which uh, the... Uh, the individual units and the client service uh, units, such as the 500 people here, operate. So we are we are a decentralized organization um, because everything happens in the field, right? So we have our corporate office in New York, which has about 150 people, but we have we call it HQ2 in Atlanta, which probably has 150 people, and we have a big big office in Chicago, LA, San Francisco. So. You have to be with the people. You have to be with the frontline workers. So we operate in a distributed way. That probably helped us a lot through COVID, right? Because we were already distributed. Um, and, and we think, again, that's another knock-on effect of COVID. I, I think there's very few firms that feel like we got to put everything together now versus after this pandemic, realize being distributed is, is a winning play. How, how do you... Uh... How do you ensure quality control and uh, cost control, uh, the discipline necessary, uh, if you are decentralized? Yeah, that's a challenge. And that was part of 2020 vision. How do you put together processes and protocols so that you don't lose your way in a distributed format? And ABM never had that. And we put that in and it's been so helpful and we're nowhere near where we ultimately want to go. And again, part of this digital acceleration is going to give us the opportunity in the future. You know, I, I guess I never, I, I ne as, as a CEO of this firm, I never want to say, oh, we've arrived in any particular area. I feel like, you know, I, I, get, I say this half kidding. The minute I say, oh, we finally got there is the minute the board of directors shows me the door. Right. So I think, you know, you have to keep innovating. You have to keep stretching. And the minute you feel you have it solved, oh boy, you know, you're in trouble. So we're always looking ahead. And, you know, one of the things, you know, culturally we talk about that we think is not great at ABM is we don't take enough time to celebrate the wins. We're always on to the next thing. We'll work so hard to win a prestigious account, to put together a transformative piece of technology. And then we do it 
And the next thing you know, we have a meeting to talk about the next thing. And, uh, but I think that's why, you know, it's 112 years later. And uh, again, we, we, we're in rarefied air, I think. How many, empl this is a question, which I think is pretty interesting. It's again, a challenging question. How, how many of the 140,000 employees do you know personally uh, by name? And in a remote work environment um, where it's not so easy to go on the front line every day, yeah. how, how do you stay connected with those frontline people? It goes back to the culture point we were discussing earlier. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard. Look, when I became CEO, I made a decision that my job was out in the field. And, you know, and my wife could attest to that because uh, I have logged many, many, many miles on in the air to be out in the field, meeting with our folks, shaking hands, you know, thanking them for what they do. Um, so uh, I, I feel like this, this is, it's a contact sport when you're in the service business. So uh, I don't know how many numbers of people I know, but I, I know that I am just always out there. And, and one thing I make a habit of that, that's super important, when I go to an office, if I'm going to the Phoenix office, I'll generally meet with some clients, meet with the senior folks, but I always take an hour and a half and I take 12 on-site project managers, put them in a room, lock the door and say, this is Vegas. I want to understand whatever you say in here stays in here, what's really going on in the field. And boy, I have to tell you, Dean, that has been so effective for me because I haven't lost touch with the field and I never betray their trust. And it's kept me really grounded and probably to the dismay of some of the C-suite when, when, uh, when I'm down at that level. But I think it's, uh, it's, it, it's, um, it's just such an important thing. And I think more executives need to make the time to stay in touch with the field. Okay. Um, how have global supply chain disruptions affected uh, the materials that you uh, have to work with, if at all? And uh, whether, when, when significant price increases occur, how are those dealt with in the context of a contract that might be three or five years with a client. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the start of COVID and the supply chain was a, I mean, it's still a mess, right? But it was a complete mess then. And, you know, try getting your hands on Purell in, you know, the first half of 2020, right? Um, it, was, it was a mess. Thankfully for ABM, we have the kind of buying power that for the major suppliers, we got their attention. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, th there's electrostatic sprayers, which are, which are, are the pieces of equipment that right there for our enhanced clean. And I remember at the beginning of COVID putting in an order for $30 million worth of electric. We cornered the market on electrostatic sprayers, but we were able to do that because of, of our size and scale. The markets, the, the supply chain has gotten better. We've learned from it. You know, it used to be we would deal with one supplier that gave us the best price. You can imagine, and I think um, no different than many companies, we realize we have to have a much, much more diverse supply chain going forward. And that's a nice thing for a lot of these supplies. It's probably opened up a lot of opportunity for, for the smaller suppliers that didn't get the traction with folks like ABM that now all of a sudden are. Right. Um, so a couple of questions regarding the, uh, uh, the workforce here. Um, uh, one person is asking, Scott, you know, how do you, how do you deal with the issue uh, that many employee, employers of service workers have to deal with of uh, uh, controlling for undocumented workers? Yeah, so listen, we, we're a public company, so we, we hold ourselves to a very high standard, and there, there's, there is just ways to do that. And when people come in, there's, there are forms that you can fill out, which I used to know the name of those forms, which I forgot, but um, there's, there's proof of ID that you have to show. There are things like E-Verify that we use, which, which flows back to a government database. So, and you know, and look, I mean, candidly, this is what we point out when we bid assignments and we're bidding against some smaller private companies, we always say to the client, you know, you don't want to end up on the newspaper for having undocumented workers. And, you know, so look, certain things can't 
you know, the, things do happen, right? We're living in the real world. The question is, do you have a process? Is it a valid process? And can you stand behind it? There are always, there are always outliers, but you have to have a process and we have a really good process. I think, I think you've partly answered this question already, but someone's asking uh, again about the, the salaries of the uh, frontline workers and Florida has uh, in aggregate a pretty low rate of pay for frontline workers, but uh, would it be fair to say that ABM is significantly better than the, uh, the, the global average in a state like Florida? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and especially on campus where again, it's unionized workers they are part of a collective bargaining agreement and they get benefits. It's, it is night and day. It's a, your assignment is a, a cherished and valued assignment for these workers, right? Because you just hit the nail on the head. You know, if you have to go to one of the alternatives where you're dealing with a kind of non-union assignment based on market level, um, it's, it's, it's tough to make a living that way. Um, what, what are the three most important principles of leadership in your view? Uh, so for me, you have to be humble and remember where you came from. That's super important. I mean, you have to listen, right? Listen and listen with empathy. And, you know, it has to be do as I do, not as I say. And, and I think that it, that is just so important. And um, the, you know, people look people look to you for signals. They 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 pattern after what you're doing. So I think, you know, don't, don't, don't be someone says, oh, I, I really understand the plight of a frontline worker. And then go off the video and have your lunch serve with China and silverware. It's just not, you know, cause it's just, it's just not the right thing. So I think those are really important. You just have to be authentic. Okay. Um, 10 years from now, what will success look like for you and for ABM? So 10 years from now. All right. So that's, that's a good one. I don't know that anyone can predict, you know, 10 years, maybe five years, but 10 years out, I feel like we, we will have evolved from a digital and technology standpoint where we're just going to have separated from the competition so that, you know, my goal is that I want to give clients no choice. You know, even if they like other vendors better because they grew up with them and what have you, they're going to be like, how can I not hire ABM? The platform is so different. They have technology. They're giving me data. I am going to succeed in my job better. I, I always feel like as I used to be a facility manager, as we said earlier, and I always, I always said to the vendors that work for me, what you could do for me is help me get promoted. And the yep. way you're going to do that is by doing an unbelievable job. And so now if, if we could give our clients data, if we can make them better, if they could stand out with, with, with their bosses, then that's what ABM is gonna be about and, and we can get there. And then lastly, I just, when I took over this job seven years ago, I just wanted ABM to be a place where if you worked hard and you cared, you can grow your career and Hopefully 10 years from now, we're going to keep growing our platform like we did today with this major acquisition and just give our, our workers, our frontline workers, an opportunity like the couple I pointed out earlier, where they could just, just do better things for their families. Um, some companies um, with significant numbers of frontline workers have uh, contracted with universities to uh, provide either high school completion or associate degree opportunities. Uh, have you done that for your workers? You know, so part of this Elevate program we're doing over the next five years is people development and focused on the frontline workers. That's something we're going to be, it's part of the playbook. How do we give our frontline workers and our frontline leaders the skills and development to advance. So that's something we're absolutely going to be looking at. We had to have a head of learning and development that's going to be focused on that. So that it's not there today, but it is certainly in our future. Uh, can you please comment on the percentage of women in your leadership team versus the overall workforce? 
Oh boy, I, I'll tell you, like, this is what I'm most proud of. I, I would love anybody to go on the ABM website and look at the executives that we have. And you're going to see something very, very different then I'm willing to bet 90% of other Fortune 500 companies. Please go on the website, go on the leadership tab, and you'll be shaking your head and smiling in terms of the diversity, the women. And uh, I, I am just so proud of that. How do you achieve that? So this is interesting. You have to be prescriptive about it. You can't just say it would be great if. You have to make it an absolute. And... What too many times happen is that executives say, oh, we just couldn't find the right person. You know what? You just didn't cast your net wide enough because you can find the right person. You just have, as an executive, as a CEO, you just have to make the decision for change and make it absolute. Any CEO, any executive says, we really want to do it. We really focused on it. It hasn't happened yet, but we're thinking about it. No, you just, you have to make that decision and that's it, right? Because you can find amazing, amazing, diverse talent. What's the biggest mistake you ever made and what did you learn from it? Oh gosh, I didn't think you'd ask me that one. Um, what's the biggest mistake I made? Uh, I've made so many, you know, um, I'm trying to think what comes to mind is the biggest mistake. Um that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I think probably the biggest mistake I made is that when I became CEO, we, we put the 2020 vision together. And I did that with a group of executives that I inherited from the last CEO. And we made a deal that as we develop our 2020 vision, we can disagree in the boardroom but when we walk out of the boardroom, we have to commit. So disagree, but commit. And everybody, because I said, I don't want any water cooler chatter, right? We're either all in or all out, right? And everyone made the commitment that they were going to go into developing the strategy and they were going to do it and commit, even if they didn't love it. And I believe that. And we still had the water cooler chatter. And um, it was something that took probably three to six months to actually figure out and sort out and how to make some executive changes as a result of that, because you realize you can't have a major transformation of a firm unless your executive team is all in. And I went on faith that if someone said, I'm all in, they were all in. And, um, you know, that was, that was something, uh, you know, what is it? Trust, but verify. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, that's, a very, uh, very, very wise and uh, insightful comment. Thanks for sharing that. And, and one final question, if, if, if you happen to be lucky enough to have 200 uh, of our freshman students in front of you right now, you know, what, what would be the one most important word of advice you'd give to them as they're embarking on a four-year uh, college education at the Herbert School of Business here? Yeah, um, so... I, I, I will say this, and I, I'm going to give it as an example for me. I, too many people in my position when they retire, they say, oh, I should have really appreciated it. Oh, I wish I would have. I wish I would have appreciated it. I would say to the students, you're at one of the finest schools in the world. You're getting this unbelievable enriched education. Do not let it pass by without appreciating what you have because it is a gift probably like no other you're going to get over the course of your life. So enjoy it and appreciate it. Well, we've certainly enjoyed and appreciated you, Scott, and uh, want to thank uh, all of your 500 uh, team members for everything they do for us every day to keep us safe. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And we, we love you as a client. So uh, go Canes. And I know uh, your direct client, Jessica Brumley, has kindly been on the call with us, and uh, we, we really uh, uh, welcome all of the good work that she does every day for us, uh, along with your people. So yeah, she, she's uh, just amazing, and it's, it's just a pleasure working with her. You know, you just love working with talent. It's just easy. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us, and uh, 
I wish you and the company well as you move into the uh, the vision uh, for the next five years. This thank was you. an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us, and uh, good night from Miami.